Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Vine edition. I have Miss Nicole with us Hi. to share her thoughts on what's going on in the market. We had a couple announcements uh, come in last week, and I uh, just wanted to have a chat. One, so one big one is the first time home buyers incentive has been discontinued. Yes. Uh, so, what are your thoughts? Is that something that you were doing a lot of? You know, and what are your thoughts around you know that impact for for you in general? It's interesting because I could probably count on one, maybe two hands if I'm lucky, the amount of applications I've put through since its inception, which I think 2019 ish. Um, and the bulk of the ones that I've done has been over the last, I'd say maybe six to nine months. Um, and I think that's again just kind of you know where price points were sitting and things like that. Um, but honestly, it's it's a program that I think was kind of flawed from the very beginning, um, and that's why we just didn't see much use. And that's likely why the government is discontinuing it anyway in terms of the fact that you know it wasn't really utilized and hopefully we take those funds and you know allocate them towards something else but um when i did the post on on it last Friday, I think it was. Um, it was it was interesting because we had a lot of questions. I got a lot of calls and texts. Um, just kind of, I think, just really trying to understand. So I found that um, a lot of people were just a little worried that um, there were some other components of you know being a first time home buyer that was actually discontinued. So I think one thing that we should clarify is the fact that the program itself, the incentive itself that was discontinued, was a, a, more of a shared equity program. So it was basically where you know the government was lending anywhere from five to ten percent um, you know towards down payment, um, and essentially that could you know help minimize monthly payments and overall affordability. But that program itself is what is being discontinued. I think we have until, what is it, March 21st, I think, um, yeah. to utilize the program. But some of the calls I was at, I was getting was like, do we still have the other programs available? So the answer to that is yes. So just a little confusion, because they didn't really market it properly. They called it the first time home buyer incentive with an I. Yes. And, and I think that's probably why you would have got a lot of, because I had a lot of inquiries too, in that like, did I give up my RSP first time buyers withdrawal? Exactly. Did I give up the tax, you know, the rebate on the land the transfer land tax, tax yep. we have? Yep. But no, none of that has happened. All that's happened is this particular program, which was servicing a very small sort of market, particularly yeah. the the uh, <clears throat> cities and towns in the country where the price point was a lot lower and something like this had a lot more value. Because the reality yeah. is, like you said, if I only have 5% to put down and I'm getting another maybe 5 or 10% more from the government, they now own a percentage of my home, a big percentage of it. So if there was any way to avoid that, we were trying to find solutions to, to get, whether it was a down payment, like a increase your down payment, maybe gift from family or that sort of thing. And so this program, obviously, when it got canceled, I don't think it affected a lot of the bigger markets because it was difficult to get access to it exactly. when your average price is over a million. But the smaller markets, yeah, I know our team out in the prairies and the West Coast said that they were using it quite a bit and they were sad to see it go. So I don't think it was a significant impact to the overall population, which is likely why they discontinued it. And there are some unique options out there to increase your down payment without having to give up your equity that we sometimes will often advise clients to help them avoid that as well. So that was big news. Yeah. The Bank of Canada had an announcement. And I know we're kind of all watching the Bank of Canada, you know, very, very uh, uh, seriously these days Those to see when rates yes. ultimately will come down. So I think to no one's surprise, the rates didn't go anywhere. They didn't change. But also, like, there wasn't any, like, direct communication around when they would come down. Because I think people were looking for clues, like, is there any language that yeah. the rates could come down in the next few weeks or next month or so? So there wasn't any of that sort of language. Essentially, the feedback was, we're still looking at the data. The data is in, not strong enough to give us the comfort and confidence to start decreasing rates, but we're analyzing it. Now, if you kind of peel back and look at the data, inflation has actually come down a little bit. I think mm -hmm. it's currently sitting at 2.9%, which is in that 2 to 3% range, range that the Bank of Canada likes to be in. And it's kind of more their comfort zone, which is great. So inflation has come down, that's great. But there hasn't been a significant impact on, the, on some of the unemployment data, which the bank is sort of monitoring as well. And, um, you know, the general growth of the economy as well. So all these data points are being looked at. And again, it's very possible that in the next month or two months, we'll see rate decrease. In fact, the market is predicting, I think the math was about 30% likelihood that in the next announcement in April, there'll be one decrease and almost a 70% likelihood that there'll be a decrease June. by June. And I think the last one was 100% or like 99%. 99 or something. By the end yeah. of this year, <laughs> yeah. there'll be, uh, I think it was a 1% decrease. So similar like, you know, uh, uh, market forecast that we were seeing at the beginning of the year. So the market still believes there'll be some sort of uh, decreases. Again, a lot of this will also be tied to what the U.S. does. You know, exactly. if, if the U.S. starts to decrease rates, I don't think that Canada is going to 
wait too long to do the same. And I think that if Canada prematurely decreases rates, it does sort of devalue um, our, our loony against the dollar. And there's all these other implications. So as much as they probably want to admit it, there is a massive influence on the U.S. decision making with what we do here. So obviously we're looking at that. So yeah. so I guess having said all that, you know, what are you telling your clients? Like when they're asking you fixed or variable, like what are you telling them? I think the biggest thing in, in everything is that the fact that we're seeing consumer confidence, I am at least in the conversations that I'm having. And, you know, regardless of the fact that we haven't seen a decrease, you know, last week, um, I am still, you know, getting those those calls and seeing that consumer confidence. But to your point, exactly, the question still remains, well, what do we do? Um, I, for one, this is probably not going to be, you know, a very common an- or, or, you know, common answer, um, but I'm still very pro variable. And, and like, you know, I feel like variable has, you know, got a really bad reputation over the last year. Um, yeah. But it is something that I, I do definitely think is still, um, you know, an option for a lot of people. I will say, you know, it is case by case, right? It really depends on on each individual, um, you know, situation. But I do think that, you know, variable rates are not something that we should be writing off right now. And, you know, obviously, those two to three year terms are um, still quite, you know, the, the, the favorite right now. But in all honesty and in transparency, I'm still seeing clients utilize that five year term as well, because sometimes we just need to from a qualification standpoint. So, um, you know, it's it's one of those things. But I will say I do think that we have to also be mindful of the fact that, you know, as much as we're all excited about these rate, you know, decreases to come, you know, we're not going back to, you know, these 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 two percent or, sub, you know, two percent rates and stuff. So I think people need to just be mindful about what the like realistically is to come and the fact that, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense to be waiting on the fence for these rates to drop. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like it's it's very possible that the rate environment we're in will probably stay high for a, for a while. This could be the new normal. Is it the new normal staying in like the six and sevens? Probably not. Uh, yeah. But I think, yeah, like the 1% range, 2% range is probably not a likelihood anytime soon. I think, you know, rates should go down, you know, on average about 1%. That's yep. what the market thinks. And I think the market thinks, you know, another 1% or more next year. Like that's very conservative 2% drop in the next two years. Uh, but that kind of takes rates anywhere from the high threes to like the high fours, somewhere in that exactly. range. Exactly. Which is kind of a normal, healthy environment to be in for mortgage rates. And we just haven't been used to that in a long time. And like you said, exactly. variable rates have had a bad rap because if you bought a house in the last two, three years, mainly two years, you're just like, what a joke. My rate went up 5%. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, this is brutal. <laughs> so so I think variable, you know, has had this like ride all the way to the top of the roller coaster as a really bad metaphor here. And it's just sort of sitting there and we're just waiting to see when it starts to come down. And I think that if you have a strong profile and you have a little bit more of a risk appetite, allowing yourself the opportunity to maybe gamble a little bit more on the variable, I think could be a really big win because yep. it is expected to come down and you'll get to benefit from lower rates lower payments and all these other things that come with the variable rates or like you said like hey sometimes you need to take a five-year fix because that's the only way to qualify because of stress tests for more money so everyone's different one thing that we've actually been doing in some cases it can work is you take both you just split it down the middle a little fixed a little variable you get yeah. best of both worlds you diversify your interests just like you would diversify your investment portfolio it's something that we can kind of do i know you're an expert and you know we're not you know, we've always had the opinion that like the rates are not the most important thing. It's not the rate you actually get. It's how much you actually pay. So you might have exactly. had the lowest amazing rates today, but within that five-year term, which is what really matters, you may have had to sell the property, refinance it because maybe you lost your job or all these things happen, yeah. which if you don't have a proper conversation with your advisor, your banker, or your mortgage broker, it is going to cost you money to, to deal with all these things. So having that conversation, which I know you do all the time and the team does, very heavy on why do you want to do this? What are your goals? Let's really, really understand so that the solution I'm giving you is the best solution. And within that solution is the best rate as well, because the rate's not always the hundred percent. And I think that's the biggest thing if we emphasize anything in, in this, you know, in this video is, is that is like to speak to somebody and have somebody really assess that for you. Because I think especially with the all the information in the media, everybody is so rate focused and, and, and understandably so. But at the end of the day, it's exactly what you said. It comes down to the overall product, what the payment is. And for us to really understand sort of what what people's pain points are as well and what's the most important and then gear them in that right direction. Yeah. So advice always wins. Good advice always wins. I guess just to sort of quickly sign off here. The weather's been really, really attractive. At least I can speak in Toronto. I know the rest of the country has been a little bit all over the place, but we've had unusually nice weather. I mean, it's like March break. We're kind of in the middle of March and it's kind of hovering in the low teens, uh, you know, low single digits as well. I've noticed that that has almost like created a bit of like 
I want to say rush, but like there's way more people Moment. out in the market. Yeah. Because yeah. they just, you know, psychologically, the weather's nicer. It's easier to sell your home when it's sort of easier to present the property. People are checking out property. So I feel like the spring season in some parts of the country has sort of started a little earlier. Um, so if you could share maybe one last tip to someone who's trying to buy a home, whether they're first or maybe they're second or third, you know, what's one little piece of advice, 2024 pre-spring market that you'd be sharing right now? Honestly, it's literally just going to come down to what we've already touched on is just like not not trying to time the market and sit in, you know, sit still, like the more and the faster and the earlier you speak to somebody to figure out and just be proactive about what, you know, how we can help you plan is going to be the, the better. I've had so many people, unfortunately, kind of miss out on things and miss the boat, so to speak, because of that. And I completely understand, you know, the uncertainty and there's been a lot of hesitation in the market. But the earlier you speak to somebody, I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, some form of solution that we can, you know, kind of help you with. So chat the earlier, the better. So just get your team together, get Nicole yes. on your team and <laughs> all will be well. And, uh, and yeah, things will work out and also take some action because I think paralysis analysis or analysis paralysis, you know, is, yes. is a problem, you know, especially for the yeah. clients that are just like, oh, but like, what if, what if, and it's like, well, you know, at the end of the day, we can never time the market, but I think if you have a long-term view and in my world, long-term is at least five years or more, if you have a long-term view, things will work itself out. And it's, you know, uh, important just to get into the property, as long as you're comfortable with the payments and you have a plan. So. Exactly. And I think that's the, the biggest thing when it comes to real estate in general. We all kind of say this all the time, but it really is true is it's 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 really about time in the market. Right. And being able to to have that just just literally getting in there. Right. That's kind of where you end up having your, your leverage is just kind of get some skin in the game first. Just get in there. Yeah. Cool. Otherwise, you'd be looking back at this a year or two years later thinking, man, I could have got that for a lot less. So exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thanks for uh, for taking some time out, Nicole. Thanks. Bye.